I'm John Heilman, and this is the Hell and High Water Podcast. My guests today are legendary street artists Say Adams and Shepard Ferry. What I try to do with the people I, I choose is I choose them because of um, either their you know positive or negative contributions, um, depending on whether it's a dictator or like a, a musician or something. Some people I'm trying to uh, put put on a pedestal because I think that they that they inspired me like like Chuck D or, or Johnny Rotten or Jam Master J. Then other people. Uh, Lenin, Stalin, George Bush, you know, I'm saying like, look at how these guys get into power. Sometimes I've taken that whole strategy, which has been used by advertising and propaganda forever, of take something, make it seem important, make it seem powerful, use emotionally potent phrases and images to get people's attention, to, you know, indoctrinate them, um, and, and, you know, to at least get them to, uh, to, you know, feel like, wow, this is big. This is bigger than me. So, Shepard, I, you know, obviously propaganda is a big deal for you, right? I mean, just conceptually, like the notion, like propaganda, subverting propaganda, the the tools and and kind of the the way propaganda works. How do you get from like what Obey was trying to do to what Obama did? Just that that thematic, intellectual, conceptual arc. I would love to hear you talk about. Yeah, it might it might seem like it's a pretty wide chasm between those two things, but it's it, it really wasn't in that obey was about encouraging people to to question the status quo and uh, uh you know and and think do I is that something I want to submit to is what's the you know is the dominant narrative something I agree with and I became more and more um explicit with my politics during the George Bush era. Uh, prior to that, I'd been dealing with a lot of principles like abuse of authority and uh, lack of privacy, surveillance, um, things like that, racism. But then when Bush took office and then quickly started talking about the need to invade Iraq and weapons of mass destruction and the need for people to forfeit some of their privacy with the Patriot Act. I, um, I, you know, I critiqued all of that. But then when I saw Obama speak at the um, 2004 Democratic Convention, I thought, oh, here's somebody that's very out of step with the status quo and, um, and yet very palatable to the mainstream. So I sort of, you know, kept that in the back of my mind. And then when he announced his candidacy, I looked at his policies and they were all things that I agreed with that normally I would have to, it would have to be a hypothetical. I'd have to say, right. we can't support George Bush. Wouldn't it be great if we could get these ideas? But every now and then I think um, it's really important to stand behind things, not just against things. And um, so, you know, as, a, <laughs> as I've slowly matured, very slowly matured over the years, <laughs> I've, yeah. I've decided that I need to, I need to advocate for things, not just criticize things. There's a lot of reasons why that poster worked. And I saw, I saw some video of you, Shepard, that was kind of awesome. It was like Obama said to, says to Ferry, you know, how'd you get that thing to be so popular so fast? And he's like, well, you were like part of it. You know, the internet, <laughs> the internet in you kind of helped, right? But it's also the case, the poster's kind of brilliant, right? So I wonder whether like you have a memory, say, of like seeing that when that image first appeared and, and having an appreciation for it just as a piece of as a piece of uh, as a piece of popular art, as a piece of, of I don't want to call it propaganda, but as a piece of promotional promotional art, so to speak, for a candidate I know you believed in. The thing that I, I remember the most was how many other artists were thinking the same way, and I, I really could never, you know, put my you know hands on a moment in time when artists came together for a united cause. And, and and cracked through, you know. We we'd always been complaining in, in the '80s and obviously in the '60s, you know, during the civil rights movement. And you, you know, there had been countless, you know, artists that were you know proactive with their work and, and, and you know doing beautiful protest posters and all of it. But that was the moment when street art stood up 
and stood for something. And I don't know if it was lightning in a bottle, if you had a conversation, Shepard, with a handful of other artists, or if it was just synergy. But when that book came out, with all of those images, so you know, around the Obama campaign, it was so overwhelming. And I remember thinking, man, I really wish I would have been a part of this project because I did not know we had so many people that were like-minded that were artists and illustrators and graphic designers. What's your analysis of, of you know, as we as Donald Trump's no longer doesn't have a platform on Twitter doesn't have a public office, but continues to have this incredible power, this hold over tens of millions of Americans uh, in a way that is really scary to a lot of people, including me. Well, how do you analyze that? What is it that, what is it that, that they are doing, that, that the people, that he and the people around him have done so effectively that has given him this kind of, of, of power in the information ecosystem that now exists? Because it's really something and nothing like anything I've ever experienced in my life. Well, the, the sad thing is that there are, you know, more like-minded people that think that way. We like to believe that they're not there, but they've always been there. And all he did was pull the covers off of this thing that's been there. I mean, this is, you know, like Shepard said, this is at, you know, the, the, the core of what, you know, racism is all about as a person of color, you know, I've always, felt a lot of these things, but nobody was listening. Right. It took an army of 20 year old white kids to finally fight for black justice. That's horrible. Yeah. That's what it takes. We've all just sort of watched the parade go by and become numb to it. And they said no more. And you know, we had little movements like this in the eighties, but nothing stuck because everybody wasn't affected. And here we are in this space where we're, we're talking about things that we've been screaming about since the 50s and 60s, but now we're finally starting to get a little taste of what social justice looks like. Sherrod, give me your analysis of, of Donald Trump as propaganda, Donald Trump and, and his enablers as propaganda, as, as incredibly effective and, de and profoundly dangerous propagandists. Why does it work? Well, because Donald Trump understood a really, at a gut level, uh, um, something a lot of people are susceptible to. Grifters use this tool all the time. They figure out what their mark most desires, and then they say they can provide that. So Donald Trump said to steel workers in Pennsylvania and coal workers in West Virginia, I'm bringing your jobs back, and, and TV builders in Ohio. And of course he couldn't do it, but you know, there's there's that. It's um, promising on people that he can deliver on a fantasy that he can't deliver on, um, because they want it so badly. They will suspend all logical analysis of evidence, and it requires a public that's capable of making a sophisticated analysis of the of the dynamics of our economy, of uh, right. uh, you know, of everything, and. So this is where I'm frustrated. A lot yeah. of my art is about trying to provide a very simple and powerful or seductive image to bring people into a more complex conversation they wouldn't be happening uh, that they, they they wouldn't be having otherwise. And so when people say, "Oh, what you do is propaganda." I go, "No, I'm not. I'm trying to initiate the conversation. I'm not saying this is the end of the conversation. Propaganda makes you want to feel like you you just fall in line and don't have to think. I actually want people to think. Yeah. Thank you for watching. You can watch the full episode of Hell and High Water on The Recount, streaming daily or listen to it wherever you get your podcasts.